Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I think we're really gratified by the turnout. Uh, we have maybe 125 people in the room and a whole lot more uh, watching on our webcam. Got a few emails uh, last night from colleagues that are saying, okay, well, we're watching, so make sure to uh, address our issues uh, from where we're working within the agency. Um, as, as many of you know, we're about 19,000 people strong within our agency and only about four or 5,000 here in Sacramento. So most of our colleagues are actually doing their work around the state. Uh, so this is an opportunity for them to kind of plug in and, and hear from me. I thought it would be helpful to just give, uh, do a quick uh, snap poll. And as people come in, there, there are seats in the middle of, uh, of the room. Please uh, raise your hand if you have a seat next to you. All right, a lot of people. It's a little bit like class or a place of worship. There are a lot of places in the front. Nobody wants to actually uh, sit in the front. But uh, if you would, raise your hands if you're an, an employee of, of within the agency. All right, wow, most of us. Um, raise your hand if you are, uh, work for another part of state government. Okay, raise your hand if you work in the legislature. Not a whole lot of legislator, leg, legislative staff here. Uh, raise your hand if you work for an external organization, whether it's an association or a nonprofit or a company. All right, good. So for the folks that are following us on the webcast, I would say about 80% of us in the room today are uh, employees of our agency, and the other 20% are uh, people we work with in, in some capacity. So I'm Wade Crowfoot. I, I have the, uh, the honor of, of leading our agency. Um, we are in, uh, we're taking part in an installment of our Secretary Speaker Series. And we've had now six of these uh, events. Raise your hand if you've been to uh, one of the, the previous events. All right, so maybe 40% of you. The notion with these uh, events is they're, we're, we're, our goal is that they take place on about a monthly to bi-monthly basis, and they ideally bring in folks from the outside that don't work in a department uh, within our agency to come and educate us uh, on topics of shared priority. So on the screen here, you're seeing uh, a really remarkable panel uh, that we had here about six weeks ago talking about expanding access of state parks and open spaces to all Californians. And again, each of these uh, speaker series events are, are webcast and then uh, recorded or archived on our website. So one request uh, I would make of you is if you think there are topics that would be helpful uh, to actually highlight within the speaker series, let us know. Lizzie Norvell, where, or Lizzie Williamson, Raise your hand, if you would. Uh, Lizzie is uh, our key partner in putting these together. So if you have a good idea uh, for a topic for a, a future Secretary's uh, Speaker Series, uh, let us know. So I spent uh, most of the end of the, the, the 2019 really having conversations with our departmental directors, our leaders of the various conservancies, the different institutions within our agency, and asking them what their priorities uh, are for the year. And part of that is the management we do in our day-to-day -day jobs. And the questions I got back were, well, what are your priorities? Um, what do you want to get done? And how do you plan to, to, to get this done? So I had a lot of individual conversations, but then it was suggested on our team, well, why don't we actually have a more public conversation about what, as the leader of this agency, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get done in my own capacity. So I want to spend about a half an hour really outlining key priorities uh, that I have in my work and we have within the office of the secretary, and then turn it over the second half to answer questions or observations and make it a little bit more of a dialogue. So looking forward to doing that. Uh, and for those that just came in the room, uh, find, a, find an empty seat unless you want to stand up for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> so this is obviously an important time uh, for us to be doing this work. Um, we are facing any number of challenges across the planet. Um, this photo on our screen uh, is from the Amazon, uh, which we all know uh, burned in a, a fairly catastrophic uh, wildfire event over the summer. Um, we're also contending with uh, global uh, planetary climate change uh, and its impacts, um, significant uh, extinction crises across our planet, and all manner of environmental challenges. So I don't know if you're anything like me, um, waking up in the morning and, and reading the paper or going online uh, can be pretty depressing. And these challenges have hit home. Um, this is a family that lost their home in, in one of the recent wildfires. And we know that the impacts of climate change are here and now in California. 
Consider that 3% of our state's land mass uh, has burned in the last three years. And that, uh, that means many communities in California uh, have been impacted and obviously natural places and, and plants and animals. So from my perspective, we in the Natural Resources Agency are doing our work at a critical time, not only uh, for our planet, but also for our state. And we're doing it um, to address, you know, addressing challenges, but with a great deal of optimism. Um, fueled by Greta Thunberg and the, and the youth movement, we live in a state that supports the work that we're doing to protect and restore the environment and to protect our people and, and places from climate change. Um, and if you're anything like me, you draw real energy over this growing movement. Keep in mind, Californians get understand our environmental challenges. In a recent uh, Public Policy Institute of California poll, climate change was uh, the second most important challenge that Californians identify uh, right below homelessness. So while uh, sometimes in other parts of the world, really connecting the dots around what climate change means to people is difficult, in California, uh, our, our folks get it. Uh, our leaders get it too, and we're doing things uh, that no other state is doing. This photo is a, a worker at the Tesla factory. Uh, electric vehicles are now one of our highest value exports from California, uh, growing as a portion of our vehicles uh, that, that we are driving on a daily basis. In California, we have actually reduced our greenhouse gas emissions as our economy continues to grow as the fifth largest uh, economy in the world. And I think that's cause uh, for reflection that we are uh, leaders on, on these issues in California. And we're doing it in ways that lift up all communities. Now, this is a photo of a solar installation in West Oakland, uh, which is a working poor co uh, community within the city of Oakland. And thanks to our legislature and this governor and past governors, many of the investments we're making to improve our environment and tackle climate change are focused on communities that have been disproportionately burdened uh, by environmental impacts in the past. A little bit closer to home in our agency, the work of the women and men in our agency is having real positive environmental impacts. This is a photo from the release of a Paiute cutthroat trout into the Silver King River in the Carson Iceberg Wilderness in the Eastern Sierra. This is the reintroduction of the rarest trout in North America and the culmination of a 25-year effort um, by state bi biologists in our Department of Fish and Wildlife to reintroduce um, this species into its native habitat. I had an opportunity to accompany that team with our DFW director, Chuck Bonham, and it was incredibly inspirational to actually see um, the reintroduction of the species. You all know that work like this is happening week in and week out within our agency. It also looks like this, which is the, the uh, creation and improvement of the Los Angeles Historic Park, um, one of the largest and most important urban parks that we have in our state park system, and really an anchor of a movement within our state park system to ensure access uh, for all Californians to our, our parks and, and open space. We're a big, broad agency, and a lot of folks don't realize that we boast some of the most important cultural institutions in the state. This is the California African American Museum. And for those of us in uh, Northern California, if you ever have a chance uh, to get down to Exposition Park in Los Angeles, that's a property that our resources agency stewards. Um, that includes the Olympic Stadium, the USC Football Stadium, and also this California African American Museum, which is gaining international recognition uh, in recent years for the quality of exhibitions um, that it's able to, uh, to bring. Uh, likewise, just across the street, we have the California Science Center, which is the most visited entity in Southern California, uh, behind, second most behind Disneyland. <laughs> Disneyland's winning by a little bit. Um, <laughs> but point being, this is an institution that's actually free uh, to young people throughout greater Los Angeles. It's an incredible science center, as this slide indicates they have uh, one of the space shuttles that you can actually go up and, 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 uh, and, and stand under. Ultimately, it will actually be positioned um, as uh, taking off. Um, and the list goes on and on in terms of our agency. I, I think we all, within our work, uh, obviously focus uh, on the folks around us and maybe within our own departments, but we're 26 entities strong. These big departments, um, small, small departments, conservancies, boards, commissions, et cetera, and I think it's a, real, it's a real benefit for me or pleasure, honor to, to support the work across the agency. 
So I'll talk about some of my priorities here today, but if you don't see your specific work in that, um, know that this doesn't mean that it's not a priority, but just that um, in the interest of really uh, distilling um, areas of, of, of interest, uh, I'll focus on just a few. The first is climate resilience. This photo uh, is of a Yurok tribe member and a member of the Pitt uh, River tribe uh, who are reintroducing prescribed fire to the landscape in Northern California. And a great example of action we can take um, to build our climate resilience in California. Now, climate re resilience is becoming a little bit like the word sustainability, which it gets used so much it becomes a little bit unclear what people are talking about. So let me be clear. When we talk about climate resilience, what we talk about is protecting our people and places from the impacts of climate change, um, and specifically allowing our communities, our nature, to weather, adapt, and ultimately thrive even amidst these, these climate change, this climate change and its impacts. And so when we talk about climate change, we really talk about uh, five specific threats that we're focused on addressing within our, our agency, the Natural Resources Agency. The first is obviously wildfire. I mentioned the statistic of losing 3% uh, of our landscape in the last few years. Um, there's a whole lot that the state needs to be doing uh, to improve uh, our forest health in ways that reduce this risk of catastrophic wildfires. You all know that the governor has really um, prioritized, one, building the capacity of CAL FIRE that deserves tremendous credit for keeping us safe um, uh, season in, season out. When we all run away from the wildfires, the men and women that work for CAL FIRE run to the wildfires. And so that's part of it, is building the capacity of Chief Porter's team to actually protect us. But much more than that, we actually have to do things much um, uh, upstream from that to protect uh, against these wildfire risks. Now, it's important to note, wildfire is a natural phenomenon in California. So success is not preventing wildfires. Wildfires are part of our ecological processes. But over the last 100 years, there have been a variety of factors that have created conditions for these huge catastrophic fires to take place that we've experienced over the last several years. Uh, part of this has been our growth into this urban wildland interface and the need to suppress fires to protect people. Um, that's, a, that's a big part of it. Uh, part of this is the change in our climate. So it, our, our winters and summers are becoming uh, hotter, uh, which is drying out soils and creating these conditions. So uh, efforts like this on climate to, to reintroduce fire, to manage vegetation, create community fuel breaks, to do forest health projects, to, create, to, to restore the natural environment in the forest is critical. Likewise, we need to increasingly invest within our communities on wildfire, so this is not just about the forest. In fact, a lot of it has to focus within communities. So that's both uh, fire hardening our homes and also our communities, um, critically important. I'll mention in this climate resilience work, I wanna kinda talk about sort of our approach, but. One of the things I'm, I'm talking about literally today in the legislature is the governor's proposal of a climate resilience bond. Um, this would be a general obligation bond to go before the voters in the fall that would invest in protecting our state against the impacts of climate change. And if you work in this agency, you may very well be able to work with funding provided by this obli general obligation bond approved by the voters if it does get on the ballot and gets approved. The other area of resilience is obviously water, which is protecting against droughts and floods. Um, does anyone know where this is, this uh, photo? Yeah. Yolo Basin. Yep, the Yolo Bypass. So when you take the causeway from Sacramento to the Bay Area, you probably know you are going, uh, you are going over um, what is one of the most innovative, largest, multi-benefit uh, flood protection projects in the country, and that is um, a basin that can actually fill up in high in peak winter uh, season and actually flood a large portion adjacent to Sacramento. That protects our city, which is frankly the most risk prone city of its size, or flood risk prone city of its size in the country, while it pushes uh, a ton of water onto the landscape that recaptures this natural floodplain that existed before European settlement. This is not only a, a flood safety project, but it's a critical uh, habitat project uh, for both uh, birds. We are uh, home to the largest uh, annual migration on Earth, the Pacific Flyway. So our wetlands that we've lost about 95% of in, in the Central Valley are critical. Places like the Yolo Basin, the Yolo Bypass actually provide that, that, uh, that habitat for birds. 
also critical habitat for endangered salmon and other fish. So part of what we need to do on climate resilience through the bond and other places is do more projects like these, these natural uh, infrastructure-based multi-benefit solution projects, and also get more funding across the state to regional priorities uh, to make communities more drought safe and flood safe. The third area of focus is obviously sea level rise. And it's one that we're, I think some of us who work in the Ocean Protection Council or the Coastal Commission or Coastal Conservancy are well aware of, but I think a lot of us are just being educated on what sea level rise will mean to California. And what it means to California is we could lose 75% of our Southern California beaches uh, before 2100 if we don't actually take measures uh, to protect our coasts from the impacts of, of sea level rise. If you think about Superstorm Sandy on the East Coast, um, those who live in the Bay Area uh, contend with their own potential risks of such a major storm event uh, and are taking major action. So this is a third area of focus uh, uh, of our, of our um, climate resilience work. A fourth area is this extreme heat and really combating this urban uh, heat island complex. Now this photo shows workers in Los Angeles actually painting a street white. Uh, which uh, seems a little strange until you realize that the ambient temperatures within our cities, particularly our concrete-laden cities, um, increases significantly because we don't have cool, permeable spaces to keep that uh, temperature down. And so efforts like this um, or this tree planting uh, are, are, are focused on protecting our communities uh, who will be experiencing more and more extreme heat uh, over the next coming years. So one major area of, of focus and priority is climate resilience. The second is our biodiversity. We obviously have acute threats um, to uh, many of our plants and animals in, in California. This is a, uh, an endangered salmon. And we have to focus on keeping these endangered species alive. But that's not all we can do. So I liken this to healthcare policy. If our healthcare policy only was about uh, running an emergency room and keeping patients alive, it wouldn't be a sound healthcare policy. We always have to keep the patient alive, and we're always going to do what we need to to recover these imperiled species. But we have to do a lot more to create conditions that allow plants and animals in California to thrive. What's not known, maybe some of you know this, or a lot of you know this, but the average Californian doesn't realize how, how diverse our natural richness is in California. We know and we celebrate our cultural diversity in California, but we have tremendous biodiversity. We have easily the most biodiverse uh, collection of plants in the country, and we have incredible biodiversity of our mammals as well. Who wants to, uh, have a, uh, who wants to try to answer what animal this is? Fisher. So this is a little furry mammal that lives in the forest in Northern California that's under siege as a result of a lot of um, environmental impacts, including rodenticides that are, are used in illegal cannabis grows. And so we need to keep uh, animals like this off the endangered species list by taking more proactive uh, strategies or in, engaging more proactive strategies on that front. Part of this within our strategy is going to be ensuring that there are places that are protected, uh, landscape level uh, habitat uh, protection to enable our biodiversity uh, to, to thrive. But it's also about using our working landscapes to enable biodiversity to thrive. So you all probably know that pollinators, your bees, are, um, have experienced major collapse in North America in recent years. And we're working closely with our Department of Food and Agriculture around what are farming practices and how can we incentivize farming practices to bring back pollinator species. It's also through solutions like this overcrossing um, that will, uh, will bridge uh, Highway 101 in Los Angeles, uh, connecting two highly threatened uh, subspecies of mountain lions um, who, are, who are suffering uh, because of a limited genetic pool from actually connecting into a larger habitat and a larger genetic pool. This is a project um, which will ultimately uh, run in the tens of millions of dollars, which demonstrates the state's commitment to maintain our biodiversity even as we grow as a state. And I'm told that our mountain lion population in, in Los Angeles is actually um, the instance of the largest, uh, largest concentration of people living next to an apex predator in the world. 
Uh, another area is um, Mumbai with the, the tiger population in India. But if we can demonstrate that we can actually help these mountain lion populations thrive um, in one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the world, then we are living our values in California, not only uh, advancing our state and our communities, but protecting our nature. So number one, climate resilience. Number two, biodiversity. Uh, number three is access. I think we, are, we probably all consider ourselves tremendously lucky to live in a place as beautiful uh, as California with as many opportunities to actually experience nature. And I'll bet if you work at the agency or you live around here, you have a lot of opportunity to, to get out into nature. The fact is that a large portion of our 40 million residents actually are not able to actually access uh, this nature and uh, all that it can provide. Um, these are people where there are not parks or there are not ways that they can actually uh, travel to parks or they don't have the means to actually be connected. And so the third major area of priority for the governor, for, for me within our agency, is advancing a parks for all and really an open space for all effort. There are a lot of great groups from the outside that are really pushing and they're saying, Governor Newsom, if you want this to be a California for all, you have to actually orient your uh, natural places, your cultural amenities to actually expand that access to everyone. And so what does that look like? It looks like kids from urban San Diego County surfing for the first time. I took this photo off the, um, a, a group called Outdoor Outreach um, that actually gets kids um, into the water in San Diego, in some cases that live in San Diego County but have never been able to visit the beach. Um, if we're successful in, the, in our agency, there'll be a lot more photos like this in coming years. It's also photos like this where we're lifting up places of cultural relevance to all of our residents in California. This is the historic home of Colonel Allensworth. Colonel Allensworth was a leader uh, in the African American community in the Central Valley that in 1908, who in 1908 founded a community of African Americans run entirely by African Americans and self-sufficient to address systemic racism at that time. It is a state parks facility, but it's been underinvested over time. So this one example of, our, of, of the commitment um, that we're working to generate is within the governor's proposal, a major investment in the Colonel, Colonel Allensworth uh, State Park in the Central Valley. But access just isn't about the state parks. It's also about other aspects of our agency. Um, this is a CAL FIRE employee educating uh, young Corps members in our California Conservation Corps. If any of you know a young person, I think be eight, between the ages of like 18 and 25, um, that wants to be involved in conservation as a career, steer them to the California Conservation Corps. This is an amazing program that's taking a diverse range of, of young Californians and bringing them into a residential and non-residential program to learn for a year or two uh, skills that can actually have them contributing to this broad movement within our agency. Um, and my assumption is that these core members are actually uh, being employed um, in the context of this photo uh, on behalf of CAL FIRE. So about 40% of, of the Corps' budget is actually recouped by doing work for CAL FIRE, Caltrans, Fish and Wildlife actually getting out there. The fourth area of, of priority is what I have been uh, calling cutting green tape. And it's not readily apparent what that means. So let me, let me take a moment to describe that. We do so much good work within this agency, whether it's restoring habitat or building park trails like the one you see here. Um, given climate change, given these threats on biodiversity, we have, to, we have to enable these projects to happen more quickly and more cost effectively. And in my first months uh, within this job, I, I heard from organizations that came from the outside and they said, do you realize that a third of, of the budget for this environmental restoration project is being spent on planning and permitting within your agency? and it takes literally years to get these projects done. Now that's not because there's any failure of people within our agency. The challenge is we've just built these systems that have calcified over time that are not delivering environmentally beneficial projects as quickly or cost effectively as they could. Consider this, permitting a, a habitat restoration project, let's say a floodplain expansion, um, undertakes the same process as permitting a strip mall in, uh, in a, uh, in a, uh, in a greenfield. Um, my point is, can we figure out ways to maintain appropriate environmental review, maintain appropriate process to ensure these projects are successful, but get them done more quickly uh, and ultimately cost effectively? So we've uh, 
developed essentially like an ongoing workshop um, within our agency and with other groups who will be delivering by Earth Day uh, a white paper on what I can do as secretary uh, in partnership with departments to speed up these environmentally beneficial projects. Another last area I want to highlight as a way of priority is to lift up science. Now this is a little bit of a strange picture, but um, who can guess what these uh, fisheries or what these DFW biologists are looking for? Nutria. So Nutria is an invasive rodent uh, from South America that has the potential to wreak havoc on our Bay Delta ecosystem and our water infrastructure. And this is a great example of uh, our, our biologists within our agency understanding this threat and working to get ahead of this threat. And there's actually essentially like a Nutria task force within the Department of Fish and Wildlife that's actually focused on eradicating Nutria before it, it takes hold uh, and interrupts the ecosystem as much as we worry that it could. Next year, we are moving to a new building. Um, raise your hand if you're excited about that. Some of you. Raise your hand if you're a little bit ambivalent about that. All right, less of you. Um, so, um, Kitty Corner to this building is obviously the site of the new Resources Agency building. Uh, our former secretary, John Laird, and Department of General Services really deserve the credit for uh, bringing this building to uh, fruition. Um, we're really excited about this, uh, this move. You'll hear over the next year, we're gonna really use it as an opportunity to modernize some of our processes. So for example, reducing our use of paper, single-use plastics, et cetera, really living on a week-to-week -week basis the values um, that our agency should espouse. But let's also use it as an opportunity to kind of reinvigorate the work that we do. Um, two, two more announcements that will, uh, or two, two, two other points I'd make as we move to this building. Uh, for the first time, our Office of the Secretary will have an Assistant Secretary of Tribal Affairs. Um, we're really excited to continue to learn from tribal communities in California and really partner on the co-management of our resources. Consider this, uh, California tribes have been stewarding our lands uh, from time immemorial. And many of the challenges that we face uh, were really ones that have been developed over the last 150 years. And if you hearken back to that photo that I showed you of the tribal members doing prescribed fire, believe it or not, that, uh, that cultural practice, which was in place for approximately 13,000 years, was outlawed for several decades by this agency. Uh, because we, our agency, our forebears, thought we knew better than this cultural practice that existed for a long time. We're shifting that on its head. You know that Governor Newsom issued a formal apology on behalf of the state of California uh, for um, essentially decades of official mistreatment and in fact genocide, um, state-sponsored genocide of our tribes dating back 100, 150 years ago. That's, that's changing and part of what we wanna do at the agency is really elevate our partnership with tribes to really understand how we can work together to, to steward our resources and frankly learn from the practices that they've developed over uh, a long period of time. The second position we're creating is an Assistant Secretary for Environmental Justice. So we have done good work across this agency in ensuring that the policies, the investments that we're making benefit um, the most disadvantaged communities in California and, and communities that are overburdened by uh, environmental pollution, negative impacts, but we haven't done enough. Our sister agency, California Environmental Protection Agency, has had a working uh, environmental justice program in place for uh, over 10 years to really focus on how the work of that agency can really incorporate all communities and ensure that our impacts are, are, are positive across the board. And that's what we wanna do with this assistant, assistant secretary. I recognize that there's a lot of work in our agency already being done to really lift up environmental justice and make sure it's a core value uh, within our agency, but much more can be done, uh, which is why we wanna actually uh, have that person be coordinating an effort across the agency within our office. So that's my big, broad vision distilled in about 12 to 14 slides. Um, I wanna take an opportunity to first thank you for the work that you do. Um, people like me come and go. I'll be gone, if you've been here for a long time, I'll be gone before you know it. Um, hopefully not too soon. Um, but um, the fact is, the work that we're doing and, we're, and, and that is, is really built upon the work that's happened over the last decade. So thank you for the work that you do. I'll also say that 
part of what I'm trying to do in this job is to have more visibility in the opportunities and challenges that exist for you all. So one thing I've, I've been proud of uh, starting is this open office hours. So it's an opportunity for anybody in the agency to come spend 15 minutes and either say hello, um, share a piece of constructive feedback, lift up a priority that's important to you, and I encourage people to take advantage of that. Um, likewise, we have both a, a physical suggestion box, which is seeming really outdated, uh, on the 13th floor, but also a virtual suggestion box that any employee, uh, you know, um, can either identify themselves or on an anonymous basis provide us uh, suggestion. Um, my biggest priority is to support the work that you're doing. When, as I said, we are 26 entities strong, 19,000 people strong, and if we're being successful at the secretary's office, it's ultimately enabling you to do your jobs as best as you can. Let me transition to questions and comments, and uh, we've got some members of our uh, secretary's a team that I might put on the spot uh, if I don't know an answer to this question. Um, but um, why don't we uh, just take an opportunity, if you would, uh, raise a hand, share a comment or a question. Um, your boss will give you a day off of work if you're the first one to ask the question in the room. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the issues I, I know that's been important to you is to work, work across um, and departments. In the San Joaquin Valley, we have a really big issue with the groundwater um, sigma. And what uh, PPIC is saying, maybe uh, three quarters of a million to a million acres would be retired. That's one of those areas that quite a few of the, the departments and agencies, you know, beyond resources agencies, can work together to make things better for our biodiversity, for our water issues, and other things. Yep. What's your thoughts on, on how? make this work. Yeah. So John is our executive director of the San Joaquin River Conservancy. And if you want to, you can introduce yourself and, and where you come from. So obviously, we are undertaking a, a major shift in water policy. Um, in a given year, anywhere between a third and half the water we use in the state is derived from our underground aquifers. And in some parts of the state, like the southern San Joaquin Valley, it's a, it's a much larger percentage uh, of, of water supply. Over decades, we've been depleting that, that groundwater resource um, such that, in some cases, we are worried about actually losing the resource uh, totally in coming years and decades. That would be catastrophic um, to the communities that rely on that groundwater, to agriculture, and to groundwater-dependent ecosystems. So in 2014, the state did something that it hadn't done in 150 years and was the last Western state to do, which is put a law in place to regulate groundwater to basically require that local communities organize themselves to bring groundwater basins back into sustainable yield. And so uh, fast forward five years, uh, just last month, um, the plans uh, to, for each of those depleted groundwater basins to come into balance was due uh, to the Department of Water Resources. It's an interesting approach because the idea is not Sacramento is gonna tell you how to manage your basin, it's locals are going to uh, uh, develop these plans to manage their basins. And then if they can't, then they'll get help from the state. The fact is that estimates suggest that upwards between 500,000 and 1.5 million acres of land will have to be fallowed in order to bring um, that water supply into balance. And so John raises a really good question about what is the state actually doing to help those local communities. Um, part of it is we, we need to get resources. The state spent about a billion dollars through former bond revenues or existing bond revenues to help locals make this transition, but we have to do more. So within that climate resilience bond, we're proposing from the governor's perspective, spending $400 million more to help locals make this transition. We also have money in this year's proposed budget to actually help local counties and groundwater management agencies plan their following. So you can imagine if, if, if organized, um, following can take place to minimize environmental impact, maybe create an ancillary revenue stream that's not necessarily farming for the folks that, that end up following, and then even creating some other benefits like uh, biodiversity, so-called ecosystem services. Um, we're also doubling down on water efficiency programs in depleted basins, so we can actually, as a state, provide resources to farmers to improve water efficiency so they have to use less water given that there's a need to bring that in, uh, basin into sustainable yield. The Sigma effort is a big multi-agency effort uh, across uh, the Department of Food and Agriculture and Cal EPA, and we have developed a water resilience portfolio 
directed by the governor to really map out what we need to do for water resilience. And this is one of the, one of the recommendations of that portfolio is to develop an interagency task force. So if there are entities like San Joaquin River Conservancy that want to be on that, we invite you to join us. Yeah. And we should, we should do this by mic so that uh, those watching by webcam can hear us. Uh, hi, uh, Graham Chisholm, Conservation Strategy Group. Um, you know, obviously having is great. Um, you know, one of the questions is, uh, do you have goals around these priorities and how do you intend to measure progress so you and others know if you're succeeding? Yeah, it's a great question. So priorities are great, but how do we measure the achievement of those priorities? Um, and it differs by each of those priority areas. So for example, on the cutting, on cutting green tape, getting environmentally beneficial stuff done more quickly, we have, a, we have a near term product that will be developed by Earth Day and it'll be a public product, a public white paper to identify, okay, here are the, here are the opportunities me as secretary and other agencies have to make changes now to speed up this work. Um, climate resilience, I think, is a big, you know, sort of broader, more ambitious priority. Amanda Hansen on our team is driving that. I think we will, uh, I will really focus over coming months on partnering with the legislature to get a good um, bond on the, on the ballot that can generate billions of dollars of investment. As you and others know, um, m many of our resources that we have in our agency are actually generated by these bonds. So it's critically important that we continue um, to, 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 to bring in this resource from these bonds. So I'll measure that. I think ultimately though, uh, with Amanda's help, we're gonna be developing more specific measure, metrics um, to really measure climate resilience. Um, biodiversity is in progress. The governor, uh, governor Brown's administration at the tail end of his term issued a biodiversity executive order and a biodiversity roadmap. We're working with external partners, like I see Dan Glusenkam from the Native Plant Society, the University of California, to essentially re-energize, create a, an updated roadmap on biodiversity. We're already taking on some um, uh, priorities within that. So for example, making environmental, mit environmental mitigation more effective, um, to actually maintain biodiversity. But what we owe our community is a specific plan. And we're gonna come forward with that in, in the next several months. And then lastly on access, big down payment on our priority was made with the governor's proposed budget in, in January where State Parks is proposing $65 million of new general fund uh, focused on building, improving access of Californians to parks, including what would be the first uh, acquisition of a state park in a very long time. But that's only the down payment. Much like biodiversity, we owe our stakeholders uh, more of a concrete plan about in coming years, how are we gonna actually achieve this access? Um, I would say too, this is a little bit open source. So if you have good ideas around um, these priorities and achieving these priorities or identify pitfalls to avoid, please come talk to us. Um, from our perspective, we're not, these are big audacious goals. The Natural Resources Agency is not going to achieve them. Um, we can do our part, but we have to work with external groups to actually get this done. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer Savage, Surfrider Foundation. Um, this might be a bit of a dangerous question, so hopefully not. Um, but first of all, you know, these different priorities that you've outlined, Surfrider are clearly very on board and in agreement with. But in the work that we do, what we have observed is a, a sort of historical lack of coordination and cooperation at times between state agencies. And without that, these are such big, audacious goals, good ones. But you know, how do you plan to sort of transform the working relationships between the agencies to be more effective? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think probably we all experience these silos in our work, whether we're in state government or not. Um, you know, in state government, we're, a, we're an organization of 220,000 people. So there is good reason that we are split into agencies with specific tasks. We have our own statutory authorities. But that has created a challenge, which you point out, which are these, um, these deep silos um, where there isn't enough coordination and there isn't enough collaboration across our agencies. And that's a big challenge. If you think about climate resilience, we will not strengthen you know, California's climate resilience, protecting our people and nature against climate change unless we work across agencies. 
Governor Newsom, to his credit, sat us down really the first week, our secretaries, and he basically said, look, very few people outside of Sacramento even know the differences between your agencies. Uh, you may feel very important in your own agency, but um, not that many people care. Uh, <laughs> And so his point was like, we're either getting this done or not. So good example of where we are improving as a state government is on water resilience. So he directed us through executive order. He said, I want a roadmap to improve um, you know, our, our drought preparation, our flood preparation. Um, what can we do in the next three years to put us in a good position in coming decades? But you all have to work together. So Cal EPA and the Water Board Resources and Department of Water Resources, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Food and Agriculture, and you all have to come up with this together. And it was, a, it was a process. I mean, we all like each other, but we all have our own priorities. But we had to hash it out. And so then what we, what we brought back to the governor's office for consideration was this, this sort of um, integrated, holistic approach. We're also challenging ourselves in the climate resilience bond, and specifically in so-called trailer bill language that specifies how we would implement the bond to actually um, uh, develop resilience principles through the Strategic Growth Council, which is a body that uh, a lot of secretaries sit on and it's a public body. So the notion is rather than just do a bunch of resilience programs that may work, may not, may be connected, may not, we're gonna start, at least this is our proposal, with establishing essentially um, the, pro the shape of the programs through this public process at the, the Strategic Growth Council. Ultimately, it would go back to the legislature um, for consideration and approval of these programs. Um, so I would say we, are, we recognize the problem of that lack of coordination just institutionally. I think it's just, it's no one's, it's no one's fault. It, there's just a lot of institutional uh, baggage there and we're working to overcome it. I would say, you know, whether it's Surfrider, you know, in your work on, on oceans and coasts or other organizations, if you see an area where we're just not coordinating well within our agency or across agency, let us know. Um, a lot of times you sort of lose sight of the forest for the trees in these jobs, and it's that external perspective that helps you understand when that's not happening. Yeah. I wanted to follow up on that. This is Christiana Darlington with uh, Placer, Mendocino, and Northern Sonoma Air Districts. So one place where coordination is also critical is in your first priority relating to fire. So right now at the Public Utility Commission, they're doing a microgrid proceeding where they're looking at how to handle PSPS. And part of that will be the fact that, that you need baseload power in order to run intermittent resources, can't do that alone. So the Bioenergy Action Plan, which is very old now, it's eight or nine years old, would be an amazing place um, an avenue for you to address the issues related to bioenergy uh, and how that could be used to supply baseload energy to microgrids, as well as using the Lawrence Livermore Lab study that just came out a couple of weeks ago about the value of bioenergy to decarbonize and get to neutral. So I just wanted to get some thoughts about the bioenergy action plan yeah. on your agenda. Well, look, fascinating question. I think I'll answer your question. I'll answer you know the topic that or respond in a couple of ways. One is. We talk about coordination between our state agencies. We need to improve coordination between local agencies and regional agencies and the state, particularly on climate resilience. Um, it used to be that prescribed fire um, was very challenging because different agencies had different perspectives. So if you're a local air agency and you're trying to control for air quality, you may be concerned about prescribed burns because they bring your uh, air pollution up on a localized basis. Um, and that was, that was an issue that we had to work through. And that's an issue that I think is largely being worked through. Bioenergy is another fascinating area that requires coordination. It's the idea of taking um, um, essentially things that you cut down within the forest when you're managing vegetation, you're creating fuel breaks, and actually putting it to use by converting it to energy. And the notion is if you had um, these decentralized bioenergy stations across the Sierra Nevada, for example, you would create an economic incentive to get that, th those slash piles out of the forest and turn them into energy. What's happening right now without those is, and I've seen them, you have slash piles, essentially dead wood, uh, three stories high. And not only are they emitting methane, but they're a huge wildfire risk. And so this has been an area where different parts of the state have, have had different positions. The California Public Utilities Commission has had one uh, position in part because uh, rate payer funding would be required to subsidize this, which can be challenging. Uh, CAL FIRE has had another position 
Um, other agencies have had other positions. The, we have within our agency the California Energy Commission, the CEC, really sort of the cutting edge of really understanding how our energy system is going to transform to meet all of our goals. So your, your, your point is well taken, and I completely agree with it, which is our administration needs to com communicate more of a unified approach to bioenergy and work with, with, with the regions to actually implement that approach. And I, I won't say much more than it's, it's a work in progress and we recognize um, that it's something we need to do. Hi, Secretary uh, Crowfoot. Thank you for your time today. Uh, great discussion. Uh, my name is Ryan Kenny. I'm with uh, Clean Energy. Uh, we're the nation's largest provider of renewable natural gas transportation fuel. And I was just wondering if uh, progress has been made on the governor's campaign um, goal to ditch diesel. Um, you know, the Energy Commission uh, for the third year this year will probably um, not fund low NOx vehicles. Biofuels will not be funded for infrastructure and production. And I'm just wondering if progress is being made on ditch diesel and where the money might come from, because obviously GGRF is uh, diminishing uh, year by year and the funds just aren't there to really move forward a lot. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were and if yeah, it plans. It's a great a question. question. And I'll get myself in trouble because it's a little out of my depths, but uh, never, never scared me from answering a question before. Um, so we have this big challenge in California with localized air pollution which is despite we have the fact that we have some of the strongest air quality laws in the, in the country, we also have some of the worst air quality in the country. So if you live in communities near the port of LA and Long Beach, um, you live in a community that suffers a disproportionate rate of childhood asthma as a result of that air pollution. If you live in parts of the San Joaquin Valley, same thing. Diesel uh, emissions or diesel pollution is a major source of that. And so the governor and others have been focused on trying to reduce the amount of of vehicles using these uh, conventional diesel technologies. One area of opportunity is natural gas and large, large vehicles that can be fueled by natural gas. That in itself is another, sort of brings us to another conversation, which is what is the role of liquid gas into our future? We in the state have established a state policy of achieving carbon neutrality by the middle of the century, meaning essentially those, those emissions that are being reduced are essentially going to, to zero out. And if you follow you know, climate scientists, it's that level of ambition we need to achieve um, later in the century to actually avert catastrophic climate change. And so the open question is, um, what role does natural gas play in that? Um, if you converted all of the vehicles using diesel, conventional diesel technology right now to natural gas, there would be huge air quality improvements. But then what does that look like in 2040 when there is still a, a smaller emission footprint within that natural gas as you're trying to get to zero. So the short of it is, I think you have, I mean, this is not a punt because I don't know exactly, you know, how I'd answer your question unequivocally, but I think the Energy Commission has been, has been thinking a lot about this, which is what does that transition look like? And what's the role that natural gas plays in that transition? And I think we're very open to having the conversation around it playing a role in the transition. Hello, my name is Mariah Looney. I'm a resident of Lode. Um, the new Trump biological opinions and long-term operations of the state water project will allow for 370,000 additional acre feet of water to be exported. And the fourth climate change assessment for California reveals that droughts will be longer. So my question is, where's the analysis for the voluntary agreements examining what the water quality impacts will be for Delta environmental justice communities, particularly Stockton, and especially in regards to harmful algal blooms? That is the definition of a tough question. Um, <laughs> but I'll try to answer it. Um, and I won't go, uh, I'll go, in, I'll go a little bit in the weeds, but hopefully uh, keep it at, a, at a, a place we can all follow the conversation. So we have these declining salmon populations in the state, and many of them are endangered, and they face multiple threats. One of those threats is the way that our water gets exported from the Delta. Um, we use very large pumps uh, to export a portion of water that flows into the San Joaquin in Sacramento and through the Delta. And that water has essentially helped make California into what it is today, a state of 40 million people, fifth largest economy in the world. Challenge is that there are, the Delta is also a biodiversity hotspot and a lot of the endangered species um, that we have, uh, fish endangered species, rely on the, on the Bay Delta. 
Uh, the salmon migrate through. Then we have other fish like the delta smelt that live their whole life in, uh, in the delta. We have rules that govern the pumping um, that I just mentioned to protect endangered species, and they're called federal biological opinions. President Trump is coming to California tomorrow uh, to talk about California water in the Central Valley, and he will likely raise this question of um, an effort by federal agencies to update these rules. Um, many contend that they are insufficient, these new rules uh, proposed by the Trump administration to protect these endangered fish. Um, we agree, we have agreed. Uh, we've made clear in the, in the fall that um, we don't believe that the federal rules are sufficient to protect these endangered species. So that is, I, I, wanna, I wanna sort of park that. That is this question of protecting endangered species through the pumps. There's much broader threats to the health of these fisheries, and that is the water that flows through these rivers into the delta and the habitat that they have to actually live their lives. And in both cases, we need more flows and more habitat. And that is, to me, the real holistic solution to bring back these species. There's, two, there's at least two ways to do that. The Water Board, which is in our sister agency, Cal EPA, um, could regulate and require a certain amount of unimpaired flows into those rivers. And they need to do something because there's a state law that requires the, the protection of the health of these waterways. There's an, the, I think the opportunity there is that the state board has the regulatory authority to do this. The challenge is that it will take a very long time to actually uh, proceed through this regulatory process, um, adjudicate water rights, and address litigation to, to improve the, uh, those wa water flows. We're talking between seven and 20 years. So if you're talking about a salmon species that needs help now, the challenge with the regulatory process, and I think everybody, regardless of, of where they fit on, on whether they support that, um, thinks it's gonna take a very long time. We've been pursuing within the Newsom administration an alternative pathway, which are called voluntary agreements. And they're not voluntary in the sense that somebody can either choose not to participate or not. They're going to be legally enforceable. But the idea is, instead of that regulatory pathway, we bring all the water users together and the state agencies and the federal agencies and environmental conservation groups that want to participate and say, okay, what do we need to actually uh, recover these species by way of flow and habitat? That regulatory process, the Water Board, can only regulate flow. So the benefit of these voluntary agreements is that they will, we think they will increase the flows but also increase habitat. So a couple weeks ago, we identified uh, a framework for these voluntary agreements. $5 billion of investment between the state agencies, federal agencies, and water users to vastly expand ha habitat, about 60,000 acres of habitat, improve flows to bring back these species. We have some of our colleagues in the environmental community that feel like that's either not enough um, or isn't going to be as, as effective as the regulatory process. Um, and so that's part of, I think, some of the criticism we hear from people that, that don't support the voluntary agreements. Our response is this. Um, we spent about a year really trying to assess a, a package that's legally and scientifically adequate. Um, its next step as a framework would be to turn it into a proposed agreement. It would then undertake or undergo scientific peer review um, by academics that have no connection to any of us in California. Then it would go through a CEQA process. Then it would be considered by the Water Board in open hearings in which they have to uh, identify the scientific basis of the voluntary agreement. So that's a long way of saying we are trying to be proactive to recover these species. And our own take is the regulation litigation cycle has failed these species for a long time and, and may fail them again. So we're trying this third way. The big challenge is these biological opinions uh, because they're the separate but overlapping uh, challenge we're dealing with. So we've been very clear. Our goal is ultimately finding a pathway with these federal agencies and these water users to improve the system um, as quickly as we can. At the same time, we need to stand up for California's endangered species and where there are material inadequacies within that federal proposal, we need to identify them. So you'll hear more about that this week. And I would just say, um, for those that wanna have a conversation um, you know, after this visit of the president and after various agency actions, I welcome that. Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Morningstar Galley and I'm with Save California Salmon. 
My questions are, why is the governor's office not fighting back against the Trump water plan and instead prioritizing plans that will reduce flows for salmon in the Delta, Sacramento, and Trinity rivers, and thus for cutting the green tape, the regulations? And the economy's health, it's a follow-up to the last question, the economy's health and subsistence of tribal and coastal communities rely on salmon, and how will cutting regulations help protect these communities, restoring salmon populations? And why is DWR reaching out to north, state, rural, and salmon-dependent communities on things like the tunnel and water portfolio? Yeah, so I would, I, I would ask you to, to listen closely to the way that I describe green tape. And I think that, you know, like, Oftentimes in these politically complicated and, and conflict-ridden conversations, things can get um, uh, miscommunicated. And so let me be clear about cutting green tape. Cutting green tape is not about cutting environmental regulations. It's about identifying specific environmental restoration projects and helping them move more quickly. So I just want to be clear that if we're, we, can, we can disagree whether that's a good idea to try to bring these projects uh, online more quickly, but I want to make sure that our discussion of cutting green tape doesn't get uh, uh, brought into or sort of mischaracterized in, the, in this broader effort. As it relates to uh, uh, standing up to the Trump administration on, on these topics, um, I think we've always maintained that, um, that we are going to identify the problems or the challenges and seek to resolve those challenges, um, but that if the, uh, if the uh, new rules are put into place, we would take appropriate action. The new rules have not been put into place yet, uh, presumably, they may be put into place this week, and I just invite you to, uh, to, to follow uh, our actions closely based on the activation of those rules. Good. Have I exhausted you or sufficiently intimidated you from asking a question about water policy? <laughs> um, listen, we're at the bottom of the hour, but I did want to share um, that, whoop, that our next... Uh, Secretary Speaker series is on climate resilience in the Sierra Nevada and is a really good example of trying to bring in experts from the outside to educate us within our agency. If you have any suggestions around uh, ways that we can uh, do more of this, if this is something that's exciting to you, kind of getting out of your box and having this conversation, let us know. We're also contemplating in association with Earth Day, it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day uh, in April, is potentially doing a day of science. Uh, within our agency where we almost do uh, TED Talks uh, from some of our agency scientists um, on, in, a, in a room like this. Lizzie, I think I brought up that idea to you. Uh, but um, in any event, um, huge thanks to, to those of you who have, are watching uh, on the webcast. Big thanks to everybody in the room for being here, for your attention and interest, but more importantly, the work you do day in and day out. Make it a great week. <laughs>